All right, so I'm back. Oh. Okay, we are live. Oh. So I'm going to delve right into this. Um, okay, so um, thank you for joining the special uh, NSF Wednesday Colloquium series um, uh, that is broadcasted right from TIF on Mumbai. Um, and uh, we have a great evening session tonight. Um, we are having an expert, uh, Dr. Prabhat Ram, joining us from, um, uh, from California right now. Um, and uh, he's going to teach us something about deep learning tools that are being used in science and, um, and especially in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, physical building physical models and understanding um, macroscopic changes uh, all around us. Um, so before I, um, before we formally introduce uh, uh, Dr. Ram, I would like to sort of uh, quickly uh, refresh memories of people who are uh, joining again, as well as to those who are joining for the first time, uh, that the NSF Wednesday Colloquium series is as old as TIFR itself. It was started by our founding director, uh, Professor Homi Bhava, who envisioned that uh, if, if it was, if one day or one afternoon, all the science faculties could get together under one roof um, and listening to an eminent expert in any part of the whole, uh, the whole bag of science, any field of whole bag of science, it would be a very, very useful sort of exercise. Not only it would bring um, you know, connections, deep connections between the expert with TIFR, but also within TIFR, it will let the physicists, chemists, and biologists speak to each other while understanding the talk. And that might, uh, you know, uh, spur new collaborative ideas in general. And it has been a very successful series for all these years, and I'm really lucky to host this series. And uh, today, it's no different. Uh, we have a, a, an eminent expert who is developing tools that are going to uh, bring, a level, I hope, a huge changes in the way we sort of look at uh, physics, chemistry, and biology problems uh, in the future, considering we produce so much of data. Uh, everything is data-driven in experimental science. So um, without further ado, I'll let uh, my um, uh, dear colleague, Professor Shravan Hanasoge, uh, to actually introduce Dr. Prabhat Ram. Uh, Shravan. Uh, thank you, uh, Jyotishman. Uh, it's a privilege today to have Dr. Ram uh, speak to us. I've, uh, uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, we're trying to build an uh, ML AI initiative at TIFR. So uh, a few weeks ago, I reached out to some experts in this area and really had a wonderful conversation with Prabhat. He, he uh, has worked very, um, you know, for, for over a decade and he's really thought about a range of uh, problems and spanning many, many different areas. And as you saw from his abstract, he's really thought very deeply on these problems. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, briefly tell you what uh, Prabhat uh, has done in the trajectory of his career. He uh, got his PA, uh, sorry, bachelor's at uh, IIT Delhi in computer science, and then he subsequently went uh, to the U.S. for a master's at Brown University in computer science. Uh, then subsequently, he um, spent uh, many years, uh, over a decade, in various computing uh, divisions, and he's, you know, he worked on visualization of large data sets and just generally how to deal with large data, building uh, huge computing systems. He's been, he's been a lead PI on, on many large uh, computing grants that uh, involve installation and, and you know, running these big systems. It's very complicated. Uh, for those of you who, who do big computing, you know that it's a very serious business to manage, run, and, and you know, even to you know, visualize these data is really non-trivial. Uh, and uh, so at, at, um, at some point uh, in this process, uh, 
I think he was uh, attracted to uh, uh, environmental science. And so in 2012, he uh, embarked on a PhD in, uh, in earth and planetary sciences at, at uh, University of Berkeley, California, where he uh, you know, worked on a variety of topics, but his most impressive uh, uh, piece of, uh, his most impressive contribution was the use of uh, deep learning uh, and, and machine learning techniques to predict and, and uh, compute weather, basically. And for this, for this, his seminal result actually is the is the ACM is culminated in the ACM Gordon Bell Prize. For those of you that know, this is a Nobel Prize equivalent for computing. So you have the Nobel Prize, of course, for you know a range of fundamental sciences. You have the Turing Award for for computing, and you have the Gordon Bell Prize for executing in, in a very large computation. Typically, the Gordon Bell Prize is, uh, is for a highly innovative work. So you have to not only be able to run extremely large calculations, but it also has to be, it has to point to a, uh, to a new uh, direction in science and say, well, this is, this is where science is headed and big computing will take us there. Uh, it's a very non-trivial uh, to even bother applying for these and you know you really have to have a strong case and to win it uh, let alone apply for it i mean is is really non-trivial so that that's a, is a is a very remarkable achievement so he was in, in a, you know uh, of a group of people who um, deployed it to, as i said to study weather and uh, was able to scale it to an extremely large system uh, uh, and the numbers uh, he has listed in his um, i think his cv but uh, the numbers are sort of meaningless so suffice it to say that you know, it's it's a very very big number. Uh, so uh, so subsequently, after I mean, or during his PhD, uh, Prabhat also spent a lot of time thinking uh, about how how machine learning can impact fundamental science. And so, uh, you know, I've had a preview of some of these slides. I really have to say it's very exciting uh, because he's been able to make contributions to very unusual uh, and different areas. So um, with uh, no further ado. Uh, could I please invite you, uh, Prabhat, to uh, give your presentation? Thank you very much. Yep. Sounds great. Thank you, uh, Shravan and Jyotishwan, for the warm welcome and, uh, and and those remarks. Uh, can you hear me fine? Can you see my slides? It's all working? Okay, great. Yes, perfect. I think I, I you know, did want to acknowledge that, uh, <clears throat> at least during my time in India, as I was mentioning slightly earlier, um, I don't think I was really a scientist, and I didn't really appreciate domain sciences as a computer scientist, computer engineer. And it's only after leaving India, spending time in the US that I've come to appreciate domain sciences more and come to appreciate institutions like TFIR that are really working at the cutting edge of science in India. Uh, I think the traditions that you mentioned regarding, you know, Dr. Bhava and so on, uh, I did spend a lot of time in Lawrence Berkeley Labs, about 14 years, and uh, Edward Orlando Lawrence had a similar tradition. I mean, the, the uh, the notion of team science and working in an interdisciplinary fashion at the frontier or at the intersection of multiple areas was something that uh, the DOE lab system is known for, and in particular Berkeley lab is known for. So I was lucky to spend you know, a lot of time there. Um, so you know, this particular this talk is, is probably going to be a little bit different maybe than what you're used to in the colloquium in that I'm not going to do a deep dive into one science problem or one methodology, but rather I'm going to do a survey of um, really the landscape of science prompts, what kinds of prompts can be tackled by deep learning, and maybe what the open prompts are going forward. I think uh, what Shravan described to me was that you know, you're, you're starting to think about how uh, deep learning could be applied to a range of prompts in, in your institution. And uh, we've been doing that for about a decade. So I, I think that there are some important lessons that you, know, you could learn as you go about you know, launching your, your research program. All right. So let's start, just wanna make sure that the slides progress. So can you see the next slide? Perfect, okay. So I'm gonna assume that there will be no, no glitches here. Uh, so I think first I just wanna call out a few important trends, just in case you, know, you haven't seen these, these developments. Um, deep learning has powered a number of breakthroughs in a number of technology areas. So in the in the area of speech recognition, you know, if you've used your cell phone, iPhone, Android phone recently, you can see that you can speak to it naturally, and um, uh, the the deep learning part system can transcribe the text that uh, the, the the speech essentially that uh, uh, you know you might have provided to it. Um, in computer vision, uh, you know, this is a montage of uh, segmentation and um, localization results. So picking out where the objects are in the scene. So people, birds, uh, objects, so on and so forth. 
that's now considered to be, I wouldn't call it solved, but I think we've made a lot of progress in this, in this area. Uh, Self-driving cars are approaching reality. Um, so these cars, you know, by Google and really many other entities are now, you can see them uh, in, in, in California. So it's not science fiction anymore. On the top right is, um, you know, the, the DeepMind part uh, system for, uh, for the game of AlphaGo. So this Lisa all is the world's top player in, a, in, um, in Go. And, you know, I think deep, deep learning part systems have convincingly beaten the, the top human. There are many such other results, but uh, again, the common theme here is that deep learning part systems are responsible for many of these breakthroughs. Uh, about two decades ago, many of these problems were considered to be unsolvable. And now it does feel like the whole field has made you know, tremendous progress in, in solving these uh, kinds of issues. There are three critical ingredients for getting deep learning working. You have to have a lot of data. Uh, you have to have a lot of, uh, you know, essentially compute. And those in turn can actually uh, support the big algorithms, the, the, the big deep learning architectures. So, so really the hardware is key. It is only in the early 2010s that uh, NVIDIA GPUs, for example, became powerful enough that they could operate on uh, a large enough data set. So really, uh, it, it was really a matter of the computing technology maturing to a certain inflection point after which deep learning could really take off. So uh, NVIDIA GPUs and really a, a family of other related hardware accelerators like the, the Intel GPU that is being designed, uh, specialized GPUs like you know, GraphCore, wafer scale uh, accelerators like the one that Cerebras is, is producing are really key for enabling this revolution. So again, there is an explosion of um, deep learning hardware startups right now in the US and otherwise, and that in many ways is powering this, this particular revolution. Now, it also turns out that um, deep learning uh, really does need to be done at scale. So just because you can run on a single GPU, um, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to achieve a new state of the art or for scientific applications in particular. I think it was mentioned that you know, you're into experimental science and you know that the kinds of data sets that we're talking about are orders of terabytes, sometimes hundreds of terabytes in the high energy physics community, it can be petabytes. So you really do need all of that aggregate computing capacity to be able to, be able to load and analyze these data sets. So this is an image of a, of a TPU, the Google Tensor Processing Unit pod, uh, wherein you have many, many such TPUs uh, racked up, and then they're all talking to each other in terms of training the, the deep learning model. So it turns out that, um, in order to be able to support these commercial uh, you know, workloads, you do have to be able to deploy accelerators at scale. And this is something which I've done you know, both, in the, both in Berkeley Lab and now in my current role in, in Microsoft. Now, while uh, you know, visionaries like um, Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, uh, Joshua Bengio, Andrew Ng and others have really been working on this for multiple decades, um, I would say that the science community has lagged behind. Uh, so it's taken time for the science community to really understand what is it that uh, deep learning can do for them. So in the DOE, the Department of Energy, which is one of the uh, leading institutions for, science, for supporting you know, fundamental and applied research in the US, um, you, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, workshops where they, where they gather requirements on what the community needs. So, uh, you know, there are these different offices that are listed on the top right, nuclear physics, high energy physics, biological environment research, fusion, uh, basic energy sciences. And essentially, I think you can see uh, for the last five, eight years that domain scientists are very excited about deep learning. They want to understand uh, what deep learning can do for them. So in some of these reports, you can, you can find uh, what the scientific community in the US, in the DOE, uh, is, is saying about the potential of deep learning. Now, the other way around, which is computer scientists, right? So people who develop methods, people who develop tools, people who develop systems, uh, they've also made a case for uh, what fundamental progress needs to happen in the area of, of deep learning so that they can partner with the scientists and really jointly advance the, the field. So I'll, I'll just call out one particular report, AI for Science, which is a 500 page magnum opus where uh, you know a lot of people from uh, the national lab system came together, including myself and, and many others really, where they uh, documented 
that you know here are the top 10 science problems that we care about and these are the associated uh, computer science challenges that we'll have to work on so i think as you go about you know 40 fr um, characterizing again the landscape of of problems these these kinds of reports might be helpful for you uh, in in that uh, you know these reports have been published now for the last uh, you know 5 to 8 years so um, i think it goes without saying that if one starts applying deep learning seriously to scientific prompts, then you will need uh, access to a high-performance computing center. <clears throat> so in the DOE, um, uh, you'll see that there is a trend wherein the newer systems that are getting deployed, so starting from the summit system at Oak Ridge National Lab to Perlmutter system at NERSC, which is the supercomputing center at Berkeley Lab, where I used to work, to Aurora, which is the system at uh, upcoming system at uh, Argonne National Lab, all of them now claim that they can support not just simulation workloads, which have historically been the norm for, for the DOE, not just data analytics workloads, which have been the norm for data uh, you know, driven science for the past decade, but increasingly AI workloads, which are going to be critical for furthering you know, the frontier of science. And uh, many of these systems are powered by GPUs. So um, NVIDIA GPUs for the case of Summit and Perlmutter, Intel GPUs for uh, the Intel, uh, sorry, the Aurora system, but also specialized accelerators like Cerebra. So that's on the, the, the bottom left, um, wherein people are starting to you know, have these big, perhaps mainstream systems, but then also specialized accelerators co-located uh, next to the big system, accessing the same file system uh, and so on and so forth. So that's also another thing that you might see. So, um, you know, I think uh, Jyotishman, you, you mentioned that um, <clears throat> uh, maybe not, not everyone in the audience is, is used to deep learning. Um, unfortunately, I, I, you know, I did not prepare the slides to be a, a tutorial, uh, you know, on, on deep learning, but I did want to call out like how do different analytics methods um, relate to each other? Because I think sometimes, <clears throat> Uh, buzzwords like AI, artificial general intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, they're all used interchangeably. And, you know, you often get a lot of pushback from statisticians on, oh, it's all regression anyway. What's the, you know, what's the big deal? Um, and uh, then, you know, some people say, oh, it's, you know, matrix multiplications at the end of it, it's linear algebra. So, so yes, I think this was sort of my attempt when we would do outreach to the scientific community, I think this is how we laid it out, that AI is a very broad class of problems uh, that, that you can take on. Machine learning is a subset of those, and deep learning is a very specific set of methods within machine learning. And really, at its foundations, it's really all statistics. So, so definitely, there is um, you know, room for uh, further progress in statistics. And, and certainly there are statistical techniques that have nothing to do with machine learning. Um, so I think often, you know, people get concerned when they hear a new buzzword on, oh, I learned, you know, much of my PhD was done using statistical techniques. So now do I throw them all out and do I replace them all with deep learning? That's not the case. So there will be problems for which classical statistical methods will be relevant. There will be problems for which machine learning uh, approaches will be relevant. And then probably uh, new classes or older classes of prompts for which deep learning will be relevant. And again, goes without saying that traditional linear algebraic techniques, uh, approaches that involve graph analytics, your classical image signal processing, those all apply. So again, if you're happy with the kinds of methods that you've been using all along, great. But uh, you know, if there is any heuristic perhaps that you've been using, or you feel that the technique has not been able to completely leverage the large volumes of data that you might have in your experimental data set or simulation data set, then it is probably worth looking at deep learning and seeing if you know that additional benefit can actually change uh, the nature of your scientific discovery. Can I, so, uh, can I ask a question here? Over it, of course, yes. And you know, please, 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 please. from a lay, layman perspective, uh, is there a sort of a layman distinction between the three that you have pointed out? which is mm -hmm. AI in the broad class and then mm -hmm. machine learning and then deep learning. Is there a way to segregate, not going into too much of the statistical part, but you know, the, mm -hmm. the mathematical part, but just uh, maybe in layman description of the distinctions? Sure. Yeah, so I think, um, uh, you know, deep learning is a, 
um, is essentially a composition of multiple layers of nonlinearities. Okay. Um, and I think what has been found is that if you can structure uh, these layers, then they can naturally learn uh, hierarchical compositional structures in the data, which statisticians would try to model firsthand. So they would say that I think that these are the kinds of uh, generating functions that are in, in my data set. Um, deep learning can potentially recover all of that for you. Oh, okay. And naturally learn uh, uh, again the the, uh, the 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 nature of the function. So, for example, like you know, the, the classical example that's taken is from vision. Okay. So, what comprises a scene? Uh, you know, what comprises an image? Um, so, there is evidence from uh, from the neuroscience community that if you look at the structure of the brain and how information is is processed in the brain that you're looking at a, a series of uh, processing at different levels. So the, the V1 area of the brain, you know, just has some very simple oriented filters. Uh, other layers in the brain think about texture patterns. Other layers in the brain think about composition of texture pattern to form parts of objects. And then there are uh, other areas of the brain that are able to combine parts of objects into the notion of semantic entities like a car or a cat or, or what have you. So, uh, so I think you know what's interesting about deep learning is that it is, it is able to recover that compositionality and that hierarchy automatically without any sort of programming. Uh, the classical approach in machine learning has been all along that they can they can prescribe what the right features should be. So whether you know you are using linear discriminants or some other um, you know k-mean uh, you know related discriminant or what have you. So they've they've always been in the business of providing features. But deep learning is able to recover features natively from the data. So I would say that I think both for the fields of machine learning and statistics, I think there was um, there were operating principles going in that we could prescribe uh, the underlying distribution of the data set. Uh, but deep learning, I think, has taken the opposite approach, which is that, no, we can't really prescribe that. You just give us enough data, and then we will figure out what the uh, you know, essentially what the underlying distribution is, what the associated features are, how they compose with each other and so on. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. And how much is enough data? Yep. Yeah, so, you know, obviously the answer will depend. I mean, it's, the answer is not gonna be a terabyte, right? So the answer will depend on uh, on, on your application. Um, so, so really, I think these are two related questions. What is the uh, size of the network that you are training? How many parameters does it have? Uh, and then correspondingly, how much data do you provide to it so that you're not overfitting to a specific problem? So, um, so really, I think um, the answer unfortunately varies uh, discipline to discipline and the kind of problem you're, you care about. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll get to a climate problem, I guess, later on. But, um, uh, you know, I think we found that for binary classification style problems of a certain complexity, giving order 10,000 samples per class is okay. Um, more is always better. I mean, it goes, goes without saying. Uh, obviously for multi-class classification problems, you might need, you might need more than that. Uh, so really, unfortunately, I think the answer depends. Um, you know, just in terms of volumes, I would say um, the, 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 the volumes of data that we've thrown at deep learning problems have ranged from uh, order tens of gigs, hundreds of gigs to terabytes in cases. And uh, again, it, it sort of boils down to the uh, inherent complexity of the task. At the end of the day, that's what it's gonna boil down to. How complex is this classification problem? How complex is this nonlinear surface that separates out the two classes? For example, if you care about classification and uh, you know, how much data do you need then to, to approximate it? So I, I think as a rule of thumb, I would um, uh, you know, start with simple architectures, uh, throw your data at it, make sure that you're not, you know, overfitting or underfitting for that matter. And then keep ramping up on your data set till you uh, are able to hopefully, you know, match the state of the art and hopefully exceed it. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, there's another question by Yatharth Basim. Yes, Yatharth? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so you mentioned that to uh, benchmark supercomputers, usually the way has been to use simulation and analytics problems. Mm -hmm. 
uh, whereas now you need to use uh, AI problems. But considering that AI, or I mean, in the deeper sense, AI is just as you have a Venn diagram here, graph analytics, uh, signal and image processing, and linear algebra. These are the domains uh, that I already covered by analytics and simulation. So what does that AI layer add that you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what does the AI, AI uh, layer add beyond the stuff on the right, like the graph analytics and so on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so so I would it will need a different benchmark. Yeah. So so first, I guess you know, um, uh, benchmarking is not the end all be all. I guess the the, the context of my comment there was really that. Um, uh, when you buy a supercomputing system, say it is $100 million, then you want to make sure that that supercomputing system over its lifetime, so the next two or three years, is able to support all of the workloads that scientists need. Those workloads historically have been simulation oriented, they migrated to being data analytics oriented, and now I guess the requirement is that they should, uh, those workloads will be AI oriented. So basically, I think that the challenge is a little bit different. You want to make sure that uh, the machine that you buy is able to, is capable of supporting all three classes of workloads. Anyway, so that's where it was coming from. Benchmarking is a different problem in that, you know, if you don't know your workloads in advance, or you know that the workloads are going to change in the future, then how do you run a benchmark when you're about to buy this hundred million dollar system so that it is, the system's performance is reasonably predictive at a point in time of what's going to happen in the next three years. Anyway, so the benchmarking, I think story is a, is a little bit different. But back to your other comment on, you know, how is AI different from the stuff on the right? So really, I think the um, uh, the purpose really of, of AI is to make computer systems more intelligent. Um, and, you know, how you go about it, you know, do you give it a, a bunch of data and the computer system figures out, you know, what the best uh, representation is for that data set and then it learns to be predictive. Um, that is really up to it. And that is what the, the modern deep learning, you know, flavor of methods are all about. And then the hand tuned stuff is what, you know, uh, machine learning and statistics is about. I think of, you know, graph analytics, image signal processing, linear algebra is completely different. I think they, they tend to be, um, you know, those are basically the motifs, right? At the end of the day, if I have a matrix and I need to invert the matrix or multiply big matrices, or if I have a graph and I want to, run some sort of an algorithm on the graph. Those are, I would think, lower level motifs that could of course be employed inside the deep learning algorithm. So you can have deep learning, deep learning does operate on matrices of data, deep learning does operate on graph structure data. Um, so those are, I think, uh, the low level machinery that goes inside many of these uh, modern methods. So I think they're at, at a different level almost. It's uh, like the synergetics of all the these uh, different classes of problems that's that's, that's right. what you're writing right yeah okay. that's right you can you can say that that's one way to look at it yep mm -hmm. okay thank you so let me, maybe let me just move to you know a different uh, slide so essentially um, <clears throat> you know this was sort of my caricature of the landscape of science problems so along the columns here are the doe offices high energy physics, biological environmental research, basic energy sciences, nuclear physics, fusion, uh, and then subdomains associated with that. So again, I, I unfortunately, I don't know enough about the TIFR uh, portfolio of scientific domains, but uh, you know, areas like astronomy, cosmology, climate science, material science are, are things that I think I've, I've heard about. And then along rows are essentially the task, right? At the end of the day, ignore the nomenclature that the scientific community is using. Are you interested in a pattern classification problem? Are you interested in a regression problem? So those tend to be supervised in that there might be a label or there might be a value that you might already have, or maybe you're interested in an unsupervised problem wherein there is no notion of a label and you just need to look at the clustering structure of the data, or you might wanna understand the latent structure, the, the, the underlying dimensionality of the problem. Um, so those are, typical analytics problems. Surrogate models are, you know, essentially maybe the, the field depends on high fidelity simulations, but then it's too expensive to run uh, simulations or they can't be run at a fine, fine enough resolution. So perhaps you are interested in a uh, machine learning, AI, deep learning powered surrogate model. And then finally design of experiments. So sometimes, you know, when you're thinking of controlling an experiment, controlling an experimental device, 
then uh, you know how do you actually go about navigating that experimental landscape and converging on some key parameters so everywhere where there is an x are at least problems that i was aware of um, so uh, uh, so, anyway, so you know different fields have have uh, different you know challenges so you might find this sort of a taxonomy to be useful because i think very often what happens is that biologists use slightly dif different words chemists will use a different word but at the end of the day, um, when you're going to engage the machine learning uh, folks, then uh, then it is useful for you to express the problem as the ones that are listed along the rows. So, Sunny, so I think uh, you know after we characterize this landscape of problems, after having talked to obviously many domain scientists and tracked the evolution of their fields, we came up with these big buckets: so analytics problems, simulation problems, and then control problems. And you know when I um, conclude the talk, I'll comment on um, which classes of deep learning methods can be applied to these roles so that, you know, going in, uh, you know, if you've never heard of deep learning before, but you know that you have a clustering problem in climate, then you could use that index to decide on which deep learning architecture to start with. All right, so what I want to do next is to, um, uh, you know, dive into uh, this bucket of analytics prompts and showcase how deep learning has helped uh, advance the frontier of science um, uh, with some you know specific domain science examples. So um, um, and and by the way, I'll, I'll obviously you know leave the slides with uh, Shravan and, and Jyotishman. There are links to papers, um, uh, PDFs that you can look up. Like if you're if you're interested. Uh, and, and obviously, the work that is being shown here is by no means done by me alone. So there is a really, behind every project, there is a team of people who work together to accomplish the, the results. So you should please, you know, feel free to refer to the attribution information to look up the exact people and uh, the, the papers, I guess, that have been published. So in the analytics area, wherein typically there is an experimental setting, there is a device that has been collecting data, such as a telescope, you know, neutrino detector, uh, a genomic sequencer, an electrode array, uh, or maybe even something like the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and these devices have been on for a while, and now you, you've been getting streams of data from this device, and you would like to solve problems. So, for example, in the case of a telescope data set, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in, in particular, uh, what we found is that by using uh, deep learning autoencoders, uh, we were able to model galaxy shapes much more accurately than the state of the art in the field, which is a you know, mixture of, of cautions till, till that point. For uh, the Dia Bay uh, uh, you know, experiment, and I, I think this is a trend I've been seeing all along in that physicists uh, you know, spend a lot of time in hand tuning their, their so-called cuts. So you know, what, the, what separates background from noise? And um, you know, I think what we found repeatedly is that by applying even vanilla convolutional architectures to uh, to do this discrimination, to do this classification, uh, you can get much more accurate cuts than physicists have hand tuned for you know the last the last decade. So I'm going to get into the ice cube uh, neutrino classification problem in a moment. I think Shravan tells me that that's of particular interest here. But just touching on biology, just very briefly. Um, uh, either taking a noisy time series uh, that might correspond to ATCG and, and then, you know, essentially predict the genomic sequence. So uh, there is a project that's been looking at accurate uh, inference. So predicting, uh, you know, essentially the ATCG sequence from a noisy time series data in situ in the field. So that's the Oxford Nanopore project. And now deep learning part systems are essentially powering that particular decoding problem. Similarly, you know, there have been notions of versions of, I guess, the Stephen Hawking device, which is, you know, there is a, a electrode array that you can implant on, on your skull or maybe inside, uh, in, inside the skull on, on your brain. And uh, you can directly go from spike train data that has been acquired to speech. So, uh, so again, uh, folks at UCSF, uh, are looking at uh, employing deep learning power techniques to solve this decoding problem. So a lot of fascinating results from really across the board. And there is an O'Reilly post that I wrote maybe about eight years ago on uh, 
how deep learning was starting to impact you know, many of these areas. I do wanna go into a little bit of detail on a couple of problems. I know that you know, there isn't a lot of time to look at 10 different areas, but things that you know, I've worked on personally, I, I do wanna go into a little more detail on. So I think uh, Shravan mentioned you know, the, the work that I've done for climate science. So around eight years ago, again, um, uh, where the climate science field stood was that you know, if you wanted to understand extreme weather patterns. So again, the, the monsoon is a good example of a, of a pattern that India, you know, would, would care about. Uh, it's critical, the timing of the monsoon, the intensity of the monsoon, the onset of the monsoon are, are critical factors in terms of, um, you know, the, the impact really for the economy and, and, and the population. So similarly in the US, um, there is a corresponding pattern called the atmospheric river, which transports water vapor from the tropics to land to the extra tropics. So exactly where the atmospheric river is gonna hit the landmass, where the precipitation is gonna happen, how intense it's gonna be, when it's gonna be, that actually matters a lot. So in California where I am right now, um, about half of the uh, water comes from atmospheric rivers. And if these storm tracks shift up or down, and if California stops getting uh, water from these atmospheric rivers, then that's a big challenge for uh, the water planning committee here. Now, on the damage side of things, so hurricanes of various kinds do tend to hit the eastern seaboard. So Hurricane Katrina on the top left, Hurricane Sandy on the top right, are all examples of features that have uh, very strong systems that have made landfall. And then when they make landfall near a big city, uh, like New Orleans or like um, Manhattan, then they cause a lot of damage. So characterizing um, uh, you know, how these events, not just the mean state of the climate system, but how these kinds of extreme events are going to change under global warming. So say 100 years from now, 50 years from now, that was the problem of, of interest. So essentially what we did was we looked at uh, a lot of simulations that have been run already. So again, the IPCC award, uh, you know, was, was given in the past and that committee tends to, you know, ha has continued to make really uh, excellent contributions to our collective understanding of how the, the weather system is, how the climate system, I'm sorry, is changing going forward. So there are a lot of simulations that are done, that are run for decades. There are petabytes, tens of petabytes of data that's already there, but people tend to use very simplistic analysis regards to the evolution of the mean state of the system. And they don't necessarily look at the extremes because they don't have access to sophisticated pattern recognition technology. So in some of the PhD work that I did, you know, I was essentially looking at how one could take um, classical, say, deep learning techniques that have been applied successfully for cat and dog videos on YouTube. So, you know, you have an image, you want to say, is there a cat in the image or not? Yes or no? Beyond just saying yes or no, where is the cat? So draw a box around it. The object detection version of the problem is I have an image, I have multiple types of objects in it. So give me uh, you know, bonding boxes appropriately sized and centered in this image. And then the segmentation version of the problem is I have an image and I want to pull out the exact pixels corresponding to different kinds of objects. So over a period of, you know, a number of years, we, we published, I think, some of the seminal work on how you could apply different kinds of deep learning architectures to solve these kinds of problems, but on scientific data sets and for extreme weather patterns like tropical cyclones, like uh, extropical cyclones, like atmospheric rivers. So this image, I guess, on the bottom right shows those three kinds of um, weather patterns and they've been segmented out. And the papers, I guess, are you know listed obviously uh, underneath the images. So I, I wanted to just give one example of um, a segmentation architecture. So this is called the UNET. Uh, it's called that because there is a, a pathway to go from the input, which might be a say a million pixel image with 16 channels. Uh, so you do uh, you know, essentially downsampling, uh, then you come up with the latent representation of the data, which is in the bottom of the image, and then the up, upscaling path is on the right. And in the end, um, what you get is a million pixel image, except the output now are just three, three channels, background, tropical cyclones in red, and atmospheric rivers in blue. And uh, you, you know, obviously you will, train this data set with uh, hand-labeled uh, segmentation, reference segmentation provided by expert climate scientists. Um, and after you've trained the algorithm, you run it on a different data set and see how, how good the quality is. So 
the, the images on the right are the segmentation result of the train model. And the bottom image on the right is, uh, you know, the, the colored dots are what the network is predicting and the, the boundaries are what uh, the reference segmentation was, was about. So this is an image of essentially the whole thing in action. So after we've trained the model, we now want to apply it to say a decade's worth of climate simulations with the hope of figuring out exactly where the extreme weather patterns are. So let me just click on this. So hopefully the movie shows up. Um, and what you're seeing is, you know, the background atmospheric flow is proceeding. Uh, the tropical cyclone segmented out, just the boundaries, I guess, are being shown in orange. And then atmospheric river boundaries are being shown in, in, in purple. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you think about this, obviously, as a space-time segmentation problem, the results are, are, are pretty good. Um, so, you know, it, it is latching on to the, the prominent tropical cyclones beyond a certain intensity. And, uh, you know, while the visual appearance, I guess you can think of the statistical distribution of tropical cyclones doesn't vary that much. Atmospheric rivers are more elongated structures with more complex structures, more complex distributions. And uh, you know, it, it does a reasonably good job of uh, picking out both tropical cyclones, how they, how the genesis happens, how they intensify, and how they dissipate. And the same story for atmospheric rivers. And now that you can do this, uh, then the science starts. So essentially, um, how is the frequency of land falling tropical cyclones changing in the future? How is the PDF or uh, precipitation conditional on atmospheric rivers going to change in the future. So you can start pulling out all of that kind of uh, information, which is previously inaccessible because you could not get access to these high quality uh, segmentation masks. All right. So, you know, it, it turned out that as we actually went about uh, training the model, um, so a million pixels, 16 channels per pixel, and uh, really a, a lot of data we found out that you could not pull this off on a single node, uh, even with you know four GPUs or eight GPUs or what have you. So um, this is what led to this Gordon Bell Prize, which you know Shravan you know, kindly uh, referred to, which was uh, we 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 tried to map this problem on the biggest super GPU based supercomputer we could find at that point in time, which was the Summit System at Oak Ridge National Lab, about twenty seven thousand V one hundred GPUs and uh, really optimize this application so that it could run at scale. And I, I think that the noteworthy uh, accomplishment here, which Shravan referred to as a big number, was uh, hitting the exaflop mark. So essentially a, a billion, billion floating point operations per second uh, in FP16 uh, in, in half precision. So that was a milestone for the field because you know we've talked about um, terascale, periscale, exascale computing for a long time. Often uh, at the national level, you think about initiatives like these, uh, you know, how can we get to the exascale machine? How can we get to the petascale machine, so on and so forth. So this was one of the first applications that actually hit the exascale mark. Uh, so again, FP16, not, you know, FP32. The FP32 machines are coming soon. Uh, it's, well, China already has one. The, the US systems are coming online shortly. Uh, but basically, an application being able to hit FP16 uh, exaflop, this was one of the first ones to hit that. And I think we were really pleased that we did it for deep learning, which was, you know, in 2018, sort of a trend of things to come. And then we did it for, uh, you know, climate change problem, which is, uh, you know, one of the more meaningful applications to, to do this on. So, you know, I had a number of collaborators from NVIDIA, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, Berkeley Lab on, on the stage for this. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, you know, maybe just pause there for a moment because I think that's the climate story is one where I go into a little more depth and then I'm gonna skim through a few others. But are there any questions on the climate science application or, you know, the, the computer science or the methods challenges or the climate challenges? Can I ask one? Of course, yeah. Uh, the, you mentioned extreme weather events. Uh, yes. uh, how about uh, the accuracy of prediction of um, um, category four or five uh, cyclones uh, yep. as the as the um, uh, as the climate actually wants through yep. uh, several several decades. Yep. Uh, how, what level of improvements can you do with this? Uh, uh, yeah. So you know, this is a 
uh, this is a slightly different problem. So this problem does not improve the uh, simulation. So the simulations with whatever um, uh, you know dynamical core, whatever parameterization schemes have been developed remains untouched. So the simulation continues to predict the way it does. This is purely a post-processing op uh, operation in that uh, given the simulation's output, however it was configured, however the physics was parameterized, represented, solved for, this will um, pick out where the extreme weather patterns are. And you can do a bunch of conditional analysis on that after, after this operation is done. But you know, back to your question though, um, uh, enhancing the quality of the simulation itself uh, say, you know, if you're interested in increasing the resolution of the data sets, again, many of these state-of-the-art global models run at 25 kilometer resolution. Uh, if you were interested in a kilometer scale prediction, then and this can be phrased as a super resolution problem. Uh, there are people who are starting to look at that. And I think I have a slide on this coming up. Um, whether those uh, super resolved models augmented by deep learning do a better job at predicting the intensification or the trajectory of cat four, cat five storms. That remains to be seen. I don't think that's been looked at in particular. S sorry, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sandeep, uh, just a second. There are two more questions. Can Sandeep oh. we take that? Um, sure, sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, this, um, uh, Govinda, Govindala. Yeah. Uh, so the, my question is, uh, how much time it takes? now to predict the storm this at alok says this category four category five i mean that do you see these and can warn the people long before the storm come there yeah yeah so again you know weather forecasting so again uh, we have to distinguish between climate long-term climate prediction or long-term climate um, you know, change versus weather forecasting. So this was more of a um, uh, you know, post hoc operation on a climate run, not necessarily the forecasting job, but coming to the forecasting problem. Uh, you know, again, uh, forecasting is really more about assimilating the latest observational data into your model and then running the model out for the next three hours, six hours, 12 hours, to get at the quantities you care about, like the trajectory of the storm and so on. So, you know, these days, operational agencies like NOAA uh, in the US um, and really others around the world, they can overnight pretty much um, run these weather forecasting models with the latest observation products and make a prediction on where the storm is headed. So I, I would think that in about, again, eight to 12 hours on a reasonably sized supercomputer, you can do that. Uh, I mean, there is, again, these are like classical simulations, classical weather forecasting simulations running on classical HPC systems. Uh, I mean, obviously people are looking at um, augmenting these with deep learning itself. And there is a hope that these could certainly run faster and you could certainly produce many more ensembles um, so that you could make a probabilistic forecast on, on, on the path. But anyway, the answer to your question is, is likely overnight with the, on, a, on a supercomputing resource. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you with the Sarvesh. Sarvesh Gharan. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so I had a general question actually. So I just stated that for deep learning applications, we, re we really need large number of data. So in, in case like if it's supervised problem, then we need output labels as well. So is it fine to generate those output labels uh, by using different machine learning techniques? Like, for example, uh, say there's uh, some segmentation problem then can we use image processing techniques and then use some machine learning models to generate data set? No, no. I mean, then, you know, you just, you would just, so, so again, um, you should think of deep learning as a very, very powerful nonlinear function approximator. Okay. And that does not mean that it will learn the truth. It will only learn the so-called truth that you provide to it. So ideally, you know, there should be a human in the loop that signs off on the quality of training data that you have. And then you can leave it to deep learning to approximate, you know, whatever function it needs to approximate to get to the truth. So no, so I think you should not be using like a classical machine learning technique to provide a label, which deep learning will almost certainly learn. Um, 
you are you're just going to reinforce the biases that or inaccuracies that exist in your classical machine learning techniques. So ideally, like what we did for the climate science problem, just to be concrete, is that we had climate scientists come in and we gave them images saying, here is a snapshot of the climate system. Mark for me, where is a tropical cyclone? Tell me where the atmospheric river is. Forget about the heuristics that you might have coded up. Forget about, you know, the, the, yeah, the thresholding watershed based thing that you've done. Just tell me visually where it is. Don't worry about multivariate thresholds and all, all of that stuff. So that's what scientists did. They marked out, you know, where things were. So that now is a good starting point because now really it is up to deep learning to figure out which variables are most relevant, how the variables should compose with each other, what the thresholds, linear or nonlinear, need to be, uh, so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, just Thank to, just you. to add to that, can you uh, can you use uh, deterministic numerical uh, methods, numerical analysis methods to do the same uh, to label your data set? Can you do that? What do you mean deterministic numerical methods to label your data set? I mean, uh, uh, for uh, for example, say we have a clustering problem. So we already have uh, deterministic uh, algorithms to determine if some particles form a cluster. Uh, so can we use that algorithm to label our system and then sort of uh, feed the data to a deep learning model? No, not, not, uh, not really. So again, you know, it, it sounds like um, if you have a technique that uh, gives you a certain result, um, then you should ask yourself, am I happy with the result that I have? And what is really lacking uh, you know, in, in the results? So have an objective metric to assess the quality of the clustering. And if you find out that you're unhappy with the quality of the clustering, then I would just uh, you know, feed in. So in the clustering case in particular, which is an unsupervised problem, so there's no notion of, you know, um, uh, so, so again, you, you, you're, you can sort of give it to deep learning as an unsupervised problem and expect it to find the clusters. Um, so anyway, so you could consider deep learning as a, as a viable alternative for the whole process. So anyway, so I would rather ask the question of what is lacking in my deterministic approach, right? What, what are the deficiencies? Where, where is it not working? Okay. Um, thank you, Yathar. Um, Sandeep, Sandeep, please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So there have been a lot of questions, uh, Prabhat, and this is just something you can come back to at the end or not at all. Mm -hmm. But more mm -hmm. thinking about climate rather than weather, yep. um, I, I'm hoping you will comment on the use of AI. And just to put the question in context, but then please feel free to address it mm -hmm. as and when you like. Uh, you know, India at the moment has a climate model, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and, uh, I'm only just learning about it, but it, it needs uh, to be improved significantly. Um, even the state of the art models in the world, uh, you know, you will know this better. The general feeling is that the current grid size of about 100 kilometers or so, these are not models, at least the Indian one, which uses any AI, uh, but the, you know, the 100 kilometer or so grid size is, is not good enough. You need to go even some say to one kilometer and that's really then the CERN like, you know, international effort. So what can AI do vis-a-vis -vis climate modeling will be of great interest to us in India at this yeah. juncture also. So please. Yeah, so, you know, this is a very active discussion, obviously in the climate community. Uh, you know, frankly, I think people are quite disappointed with, uh, they, they feel like they're stuck right now. I mean, they, they, they've struggled with subgrid scale parameterization schemes with classical PD solver based models. Mm -hmm. They've had a hard time in scaling the, the models out to more than order 10,000 CPU cores. So they're looking for new, new ways to either uh, improve the scaling efficiency, so you get to high resolution, breaking this parameterization-based bottlenecks in, in, the, in the physics. So I think, um, I, I would say that the community is open right now to exploring AI approaches. By no means are the AI approaches accepted widely, but they're open to, hey, if I can solve my PDE, on mm -hmm. the corners of, or the faces of, or the box of, you know, 25 kilometer squared box. Can I then again use deep learning for um, uh, making more accurate predictions within that box? Uh, and um, uh, again, uh, you know, there are people in, in, in a few institutions around the world who are looking at that right now, some, some, some idealized cases, uh, but I wouldn't say that, you know, they are done yet. 
So I, I would not say that this is a problem, you know, unique to the Indian models. I mean, I think globally, Worf, mm -hmm. Cam, uh, you know, I think I think folks are taking a very hard look at what can be done. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Prabhat, there are three more questions on the chat box, but I will um, tell my uh, dear colleagues to wait for a second. Let him finish the talk, and then we will take this question. Is that okay, Sashi? Uh, uh, and Sashi Gosavi and uh, Dinar Sima and Shishir. Will that be okay with all of you? Uh, let him go through the talk and then we will come back with the discussion again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Prabhat, uh, I'll no, let no, you no. go right now. Yep. And then no, we'll no problem. So, Jyotishman, how much time do I have? Just so I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. You still have at least uh, 20 minutes. I've kept okay. that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. So, I think I'm going to maybe speed up. And what I'll try to do here is to just to give you a flavor of what can be done so that, you know, if that whets your appetite and you're interested in following up, you're you know welcome obviously to check out the papers that we have. Um, so one problem in cosmology, for example, that, you know, we, we um, uh, you know, we, we applied deep learning for was really predicting the fundamental constants. So essentially you can come up with idealized representations of cosmology, those are parameterized by about eight numbers. And the question is, well, when I look up at the universe, uh, what can I say about those eight numbers um, for the visible universe? So we, we turned it around in that, uh, and by the way, I should credit Shirley Ho, um, uh, you know, who originally came up with the idea and later on she collaborated with us. And as we started um, uh, thinking about this problem, we found out that this was another one of those problems that required supercomputers. So anyway, so, you know, what you do, which is again done in, uh, um, you know, computational cosmology, is to simulate many universes. So in this case, we took three cosmological constants. We simulate many universes. Um, and then we pose this as a regression problem. So if I give you the evolved universe and the cosmological constant uh, you know, responsible for that universe, can you, the deep learning system, learn a mapping between this 3D space and those three numbers? And uh, in, indeed, we found that for these three cosmological constants, those are plotted in the bottom left side of the screen, uh, you can get fairly good, fairly good accuracy. So that was an interesting result. We didn't know what to necessarily expect, but you can get fairly reasonable estimates for these, these, uh, these constants. Now, this is something which, you know, Shravan, I guess, gave me a heads up. Um, so, so far, you know, we've been more or less dealing with simulation outputs, so both for cosmology and climate. But if you maybe just shift tracks towards an experimental project, so this is the um, uh, the Dia Bay, uh, sorry, the Ice Cube project. I'm sorry, uh, you know, in in Antarctica. So uh, this uh, irregularly spaced array is located underneath the ice sheet in Antarctica, and the Eiffel Tower is there on the bottom left, just for scale. And essentially, you know, neutrinos stream through through the universe. They actually stream through the Earth and then hit this sensor array. And uh, you, know, you want to be able to discriminate uh, activations of this uh, irregularly uh, shaped array uh, with background activity. So again, this is a story that we've seen multiple times now that the physicist had come up with a certain optimal, so-called optimal cut after fine tuning, the postdoc sort of manually coming up with the cut and that's denoted in orange uh, in the plot on the right. And uh, you know we applied a convolutional network, a vanilla convolutional network, to this problem. But then, you know, after having talked to um, Michael Bronstein and Joan Bruner, who was at NYU at that point, we figured out that uh, really uh, you ought to have an, uh, a deep learning network that natively operates on the grid as is, not discretize the data, space it on a regular grid, but just operate on the regular grid as is. So graph neural networks are best for doing that. And when we you know, got it right, then you could improve on the, on the cut in, in this physics. So essentially, you know, this is an interesting case of an experiment where the data is already there, the physics cut was already in place, but now by revisiting the same data set with a state-of-the-art method, you could get better, uh, better accuracy. So that's an interesting uh, anecdote, I guess. So, so that's just you know smattering of use cases for analytics. So the data set already already exists, and now you try to uh, you know improve the quality of the analysis results from after having applied deep learning. So I want to just briefly mention how deep learning can be applied to 
uh, create surrogate models for simulations or enhance uh, simulations. So again, you know, this is a smattering of sort of many projects. Please, you know, feel free to check them out. So CosmoGAN is a is a project where um, we train a, a generative network uh, to essentially create a virtual universe. Uh, again, these dark matter uh, simulations are very expensive. Um, you, in some ways, uh, insert the the universe in a box, populate it with some random dark matter density, and let gravity and so on take over or however you parameterize you know various energies run it out till present day you end up with the universe of, of uh, you know at this point in time and then you look for statistics on uh, do the statistics of my simulated universe match up with my observed universe so uh, so that is an expensive process it takes tens of thousands of cores uh, having run out for months on supercomputers and that's just you know one ensemble member so mustafa at, at um, berkeley lab worked on um, replacing this whole business by <clears throat> training a generative model and once the generative model is is uh, trained then you can sample that for many virtual universes and we found that you know we, we were starting to get some good good properties uh, that seem to line up uh, with the simulations calogan uh, you know i'll get to in a moment uh, there are some projects on uh, space-time super resolution so again similar to the climate context if you have a 3d field and you want to increase the fidelity of the output both in space and time, but of course for scientific fields, not you know maybe a, a car that's that's uh, driving in an environment, uh, then you can look at that. Uh, I think often what we find is that you want to constrain the the predictions of this super resolution to subscribe to some physical law or some statistical constraint. So there is some work on enforcing statistical constraints. And then uh, Josh Kanadakis in Brown University has worked on uh, what he called physics informed networks or generative networks. So we've looked at those so that whatever the network will synthesize will subscribe to a PD or a stochastic PD solution. So, uh, you know, just very briefly, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, I, I'm, I'm told that there are folks in high energy physics uh, in, in, in the audience. So you may know better than me that. Uh, uh, that I mean, these are grand instruments in science, and it really does require the whole community to come together. Um, if you look at the computational footprint of the LHC uh, around the world, much of the time is actually spent in uh, designing, sim running simulations of the of the detector itself. So to to uh, carefully characterize the signal to noise ratio of the detector and, and so on and so forth. So basically, there just is not enough compute time in the world <clears throat> to do a good job at characterizing the atlas or the CMS detectors. So you really, um, if, if you could find um, uh, a deep learning technique, a surrogate model to synthetically produce. Uh, so if, if my particle shot is coming in, in, in this direction, if it hits the detector array, this is the energy signature that I'm going to see. And now I can solve for you know different kinds of incident angles and, and geometries of the detector then that would really help uh, cut back on the budget requirements for the the simulation tool so uh, so this is something which you know colleagues at berkeley lab and otherwise uh, you know have been working on for a while and again uh, simulating this whole detector uh, looking at the statistical distributions for a range of physical properties so energy is deposited the number of jets so on and so forth do seem to match up quite nicely with the, uh, with um, you know, essentially with the the so-called giant simulator, which is the the ground truth, let's say. So again, produce producing statistics which are quite closely matched with your giant detector. That is, you know, we are starting to see. But the neat thing here being that once your model is trained, then you can sample it for many many realizations of uh, of the um, of, of the physics. I talked about the virtual universe stuff. Well, I'm going to skip that for a moment. Um, I talked about uh, you know ensuring that the trained model subscribes to some stochastic PD or or a PD. So a lot of work has happened on that in the last couple of years, and uh, you, you can you know feel free to check out this paper if you'd like. There was a number of questions on you know enhancing simulation. So again. Um, the case study that I presented was more of an analytics case study. This is sort of the commentary on 
how deep learning can be used to make simulations more accurate. So uh, subgrid scale uh, resolving physics, um, parameterizing subgrid scale processes like convection better um, are, are things that are being actively looked at. And I think there are, you know, there are folks in Caltech, uh, University of Washington, NVIDIA who are now thinking of uh, alternative models that are driven by, by AI. I think it's a little early to say, um, you know, what sort of progress we can expect in the in the coming years, but there is certainly a lot of a lot of interest in the community and people actively looking at developing these these uh, hybrid augmented solvers. So I'm I'm really you know looking forward to seeing how how the how this does, if indeed when it's all said and done, if the predictive properties of these augmented solvers are are actually better than. Uh, than current solvers, but it remains to be seen. But I, I, we believe that there is a lot of promise, uh, you know, in, in this line of work. So control, you know, I think I just did want to point out that uh, there, there's been a lot of speculation that um, the the success that DeepMind has shown for game theoretic settings. So there's an agent that you're trying to control, and the agent has a very you know high dimensional space. And it needs to somehow find, you know, whatever the optimal strategy is, could likely be applied to scientific instrumentation. So you have, say, a telescope, and you know, maybe there is a spectroscopic instrument uh, on that telescope, and you got to pinpoint exactly where you want to point that uh, spectroscopic instrument. Uh, so you could potentially use um, deep learning-based techniques for that. Uh, you know, there are light sources, for example, that Berkeley Lab has and how you set up the beam line, uh, how do you set up the um, operating conditions for the beam line? If the, the beam line scans uh, your sample, then how do you set up that sampling strategy are all things that we feel, uh, you know, th there are a number of heuristics that have been used in the design of the beam line and in the design of the sampling scheme that could likely use reinforcement learning or some, some variant like that. And you could certainly think of uh, routing protocols in a in a network, or scheduling systems on a supercomputer, uh, and and seeing if control systems can do those things better. So I would say that right now um, there's a lot of speculation that reinforcement learning style algorithms could be applied to end instruments, end computation facilities, networks, uh, and I think there are there, there are signs that you could do this uh, better, but. It remains to be seen, you know, how, how it'll go. I'll just give you the anecdote that, you know, when uh, DeepMind was acquired by Google, then one of the first promising applications was really um, uh, data center control, environmental control. So how can you cut back on the energy consumption of a supercomputer uh, or, or uh, a massive cluster in a data center environment? And uh, lo and behold, I mean, they were able to sub save substantial amount of energy in that. So, so I think there is evidence that it could work in, in such a you know, complicated setting. All right, so I wanna get to a few key slides uh, because you know, there are many uh, vignettes that I didn't get to today, some that I skimmed through, but I think the next few slides are really the key summary of what we've learned from doing this for the last decade. And um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, you, you couldn't predict two years ago that transformers would be the state of the art for deep learning right now. Um, so for sure, new methods will emerge. Uh, for sure, new state of the art, you know, techniques are going to be, uh, you know, are, are going to be established. So I think what we've learned so far is that for supervised problems, wherein you have a label, uh, depending on the type of data that you have, um, convolutional architectures uh, work well for two D, three D, four D data sets. Graph neural, uh, neural network architectures work well when the data is unstructured or there is a latent graph structure in the problem. If there is a sequence of data sets that you have, such as a time series data, then LSTMs work. Transformers have you know, come out of the blue in the last two years and they seem to be working very well for that. So those are all kinds of architectures that you may choose to explore. If you have an unsupervised problems, then I, at least what we've seen so far in science is that auto encoders seem to work, but there are likely other things that could be done there as well. For um, surrogate models, essentially uh, forming, a, forming a deep learning system to replace a simulation, 
uh, generative models such as GANs, suitably constrained, seem to be working. Some people have tried very short encoders, and there is some speculation around uh, flavors of reinforcement learning techniques for control prompts. So, you know, I, I do want to. Uh, <clears throat> this the next two slides were things that I, you know, I put together three or four years ago um, on what at least I perceived were the short-term challenges in deep learning for science, and then what were the long-term challenges in deep learning for science. And you may choose to again uh, skim this over, you know, incorporate it as as you'd like. But what we felt around three years ago was that uh, when a science community actually wanted to go forward with applying deep learning for science then uh, they would have to solve data management challenges. So again, scientific data is, doesn't necessarily come in the form of nice 2D images. So you'd have to make sure that your deep learning architecture, the code bases could handle complex scientific data set. Uh, so you'd have to think about IO and, and, and issues like that. Um, you know, this business of how do you decide what is the right architecture, um, is, is called hyperparameter optimization. And not many, uh, a lot of people are not necessarily experts on that. Certainly, you know, if you have a random biologist or a chemist, they won't know necessarily how to converge on the right architecture. So now there are thankfully some tools that can solve this uh, HPO, this hyperparameter optimization problem, but that's something that you just have to watch out for. Performance and scaling, I would say has come under control in the last two years, partly because the industry has woken up in a big way. Uh, so a lot of dedicated supercomputers are now being deployed for deep learning training at scale. So that I feel like, you know, is, is in control. But certainly an open problem that remains is uh, scarcity of label data. So if you do not have labels to begin with, and um, again, so we have had more success with supervised problems than necessarily unsupervised problems. So to the extent that, um, you know, the, climate, the, the community is stuck on, on a problem, they don't have label data. The easiest way is probably for them to self-organize, run labeling campaigns, produce some high quality labels so that uh, you know, supervised deep learning can take it from there. But that you know, often turns out to be a sociological challenge more than anything else. So that's something to you know, think, think about. Now, I think many of these problems have definitely been uh, you know, addressed. So I, I do wanna comment on the long-term challenges, which I feel are actually precluding deep learning techniques from him adopted broadly in the science, uh, you know, in, in different scientific forms. So one, I think one open challenge really is the lack of theory. So um, the nice thing about statistics and some of the machine learning techniques and some of the linear algebra and graph theoretic approaches there is really that the theory has been there in place for a while. Um, and I, I would say that um, really the, the limits of Supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning is, is just not characterized at this point in time. GANs are looking very promising for reproducing statistical distributions, but we, we just don't know how, how powerful GANs are or where they actually break down. So that I would say is, is a broad sort of, you know, research agenda by itself. Now, often, you know, scientists are not happy with just getting good results. I mean, I think if you're designing a ad system and you improve your click uh, click rate from 95 to 96 percent doesn't matter how you got there you're happy with the output but in science we care about you know why did my cut efficiency improve and uh, you know what was responsible what were we lacking to begin with so interpretability uh, of the, the the deep learning or the, the machine learning system really does become important so anyway there are a few approaches others have you know come, come up with many in, in the past but do you build in interpretability in that do you build in a physical constraint or as long as you can introspect the trained model uh, is that sufficient for you so there are i think thoughts on you know how to proceed with that and i think in, in different specialized forums i think we're starting to see domain specific uh, approaches for enhancing the interpretability of these black box you know classifiers uh, uncertainty quantification is is important so again uh, not just uh, you know, I'm getting 99% accuracy. Uh, you know, when again, when does it fail down? If I am uncertain about my experimental data, uh, how does that uncertainty propagate through the the deep learning process? Can I get fully prob Can I get a fully probabilistic treatment of uh, you know of, of my of my task throughout? So that's something to to think about. More importantly, for me, I think um, really the the protocol around when to apply deep learning. Uh, 
uh, and when not to. I think that that remains to be seen. So, you know, I I, I think it was mentioned that uh, maybe experimental science is a priority at TFR. I'm, I'm just assuming that so is computation modeling. But, you know, we've, if you look at the evolution of uh, applied mathematics and how it's been used for computation modeling of scientific phenomena, it's had three or four decades to think through uh, when should you apply computation modeling. Like you, you think about the, the phenomena of interest, you think about the underlying, the governing PDs perhaps, you think about discretization schemes, you think about solver schemes, you, you have a, a sense for what subgrid scale phenomena you are or you're not gonna be able to represent CFL conditions. Uh, and then once you have that theory in order, then you actually go ahead, code up the solver, then you parallelize it, scale it, optimize it, get it to run fast. With deep learning, it's like, you know, you, you have code that runs fast on a supercomputer right now, and uh, the theory hasn't really caught up. So, uh, so I think this methodology for, you know, when should you or should you not apply deep learning, I think that remains to be seen. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're gonna, the whole field as, as a whole is gonna refine this, this understanding going forward. All right. So I think uh, the yeah. last slide, yes. Okay, yeah, I'll be done almost. So that's why I just wanted to look at you to yep. as possible. Yep. So I think this is the last slide. So basically uh, just, just as a, the final remark, you know, AI is, and deep learning in particular has transformed the industry. We are seeing that. Um, science communities are catching up. They are a little bit behind, but I think they're catching up fast. Certainly a lot of, you know, useful reports out there that you can look at. Uh, in the US, the Department of Energy has been at the forefront of deep learning for science. So a lot of success stories right now around analytics, some in simulation, control prompts coming soon. But I think the good news here is that there are, you know, for a research institution, there are certainly a lot of long-term issues to work on. So hopefully, you know, that's uh, that's the exciting part for, for you. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. That's great, Prabhat. Thank you very much for this fantastic colloquium. I would like uh, all of you who are there, you can unmute and give a big round of applause. Uh, so that's something that is completely missing in a Zoom talk. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Prabhat, for introducing us, um, introducing to us deep learning. And that's that's a pretty, uh, you know, you did a very good job of sort of uh, putting a broad picture to it. Um, I would, uh, there are multiple questions that I have to come to. Uh, let me first uh, ask a student, Anisha Kormukar. Uh, Nisha, could you? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, coming back to the applications in high energy physics, uh, in case of supervised learning, is it a good idea to train a deep learning model using realistic <coughs> Monte Carlo simulations, like uh, taking GN4 simulations as to be the ground truth? You know, uh, physicists seem to trust GN4 a lot. <laughs> so, um, and you know, in some ways, I think um, that seems to be the gold standard. That you know, at least like in terms of a generative model, like if you care about training a, a GAN to produce realistic enough, I think at least I've seen multiple high energy physicists say that, yep, if you can get 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 the statistical distributions to match up, then that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So I think in that context, at least, uh, I, I think GN4 is fine. Do you have a classification problem in mind? Yes, uh, or... I do have a classification problem right now. I'm actually working on one. It's uh -huh. one part of my PhD thesis, actually. I'm working mm -hmm. on discrimination of, uh, you know, multiple radiations. Right now I'm working on neutrons and gamma radiation discrimination. Mm -hmm. And let's see, like I'm planning to actually incorporate multiple radiations into the, uh, you know, discriminating algorithm using mm -hmm. uh, CNN or maybe right now I'm working on DNN, I'm incorporating, trying to incorporate into CNN using, you know, basics of image processing in hand mm -hmm. so that, you know, uh, there would be pulses which we can see in the oscilloscope and yep. we can just train it with that. And mm -hmm. we have the label data, but there is a scarcity in label data as it is, you know, yep. it's always yep. a scarcity. So- Yeah, I think I would say that, you know, for a, for a PhD project, an exploratory project where you're, wherein you maybe you're trying to prove a concept, uh, mm -hmm. I would I would think that GN4 ground truth would be fine. Uh, but you know, obviously, um, uh, if you wanted to claim a true physics result, mm -hmm. then you might need an independent experimental. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. So so uh, my point is like uh, suppose we uh, 
train it on on gn for simulation and check it with experimental data set that's a totally independent data set right so does that actually prove the ground truth on it no uh, it does not you know prove the ground truth i think um, you know all you have to be very careful about um, uh you know implying that what worked in simulation actually works in experiment okay. you can't necessarily make that leap of faith okay. so i think what i would do is so certainly you know in the, in this idealized simulation context prove that yep indeed you know deep learning works and and so on but i think the moment you want to make a switch to uh to the experimental data i i would definitely sort of um you know there are now dedicated workshops that the lsc community has on on uh uh machine learning and its relevance to mm -hmm. discovering physics so i would definitely turn to that community and see if uh, how have they reconciled you know this this issue i'm not up to speed on the very latest but they mm -hmm. they do have some great workshops at this point in time okay so there's another uh, question which i am very eager to ask uh, that is based on hyperparameter optimization is there mm -hmm. a set of rules how to do that optimization or it's just a hit and trial method no it's not uh, well it's neither i guess it's not um, you know hit hit and trial or a set of rules so so again what you do is that you uh, <laughs> frame this as a meta um, uh, machine learning problem so there mm -hmm. is a optimization surface and that mm -hmm. surface corresponds like every point in that surface corresponds to different choices of the deep learning architecture yes. and the number there corresponds to say predictive accuracy mm -hmm. and your job is to come up with a search algorithm in that space that will give you uh, you know a good architecture with hopefully the best best predictive accuracy so how you navigate that space is really up to you know whatever algorithm you you come up with so i mean it could be particle swarm optimization it could be some some gradient descent things on so forth yeah, yeah. so uh, so anyway, so there are uh, there are sophisticated techniques that are used to model that landscape uh, and then people use uh, you know that that technique to get to the the, the optimal answer okay. so no there, there are sophisticated techniques in place now so neither like neither rule based not hit and try okay Okay. Thank so okay. Thank you, Anisha, for the series of questions. Um, I'll take some chat questions. Anuraj, could you wait for a second? Um, uh, DNR, I, DNR, I hope DNR. Uh, extreme rainfall events is it essentially correlated to global warming, or other causes could also be important? That's his question. So, uh, uh, I, I guess are you are you talking of change in extreme precipitation or extreme precipitation by itself? Yeah. No, the change, whether there has been increased extreme events, whether yes. it is correlated to global warming or other things like our mega cities, whatever happened. That's right. That is the That's question. Right. That's right. So so I think, um, uh, you know, that is one of the things I worked out in, in my thesis, but um, the, the clausius clapeyron relationship that models um, uh, the inter intensification of you know, moisture or water vapor content in the atmosphere to increase in temperature, that's well established. So, so that, uh, you know, partly explains that as global warming happens, you, ex you expect uh, precipitation events to become more intense. Now, what was found, like as a result of this analysis, is that when we actually segmented out the extreme weather patterns, we were finding evidence for super CC scaling. So uh, for the delta in temperature, we are actually seeing more than 7% 7, 7 increase in uh, extreme precip. So that, uh, you know, when we started looking at why that was the case, so we found that there were dynamical factors uh, related to convergence of, of, of wind and so on, which we could now pull out because we have the segmented storm system. So, uh, so I, I guess the answer is the uh, purely uh, temperature uh, you know, contribution to the intensification of extreme precipitation, that is a factor, but there are dynamic, dynamical factors as well. Okay, thank you. Ha, huh. okay, so now there's uh, a set of questions. Um, of course, Dhanraj and Anushka, I'll just, just finish this. Let me finish this because people have put, taken the time and put that in the chat. Um, the next question is from uh, Shishir. How this post-processing step of deep learning helps in the analysis of weather forecasting, which is, I guess, um, you address some, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Like yeah, so so again, you know, this is not a weather forecast, right? So these are decadal simulations. So things that have been run for tens of years. Right. And the way um, deep learning 
uh, helps here is that, so imagine that now you have a tool that gives you near perfect segmentation results. I give you an image, you run this tool, you get a segmentation mass saying, here's my tropical cyclone, here are the AR, atmospheric river, pixels and so on. So now, you know, once you have this tool, right, you can just apply it very inexpensively. I mean, the, the inference part is very quick. Okay. Um, so, so the way it helps is that like just the question that was just asked, um, uh, if there is some underlying uh, physical relationship like the clausius clapron relationship, right. uh, I can see if my precipitation conditional on tropical cyclones follows the CC relationship in future climate regimes. Okay. And like in our case, we found it does not, um, then what, why are we seeing this departure from a known physical law? Uh, so in, in this case, you know, again, we had some alternative hypothesis saying that fine, the CC relationship accounts for the temperature contribution, but the dynamic contribution is something we have not yet looked at. Let's code up the dynamic contribution. So compute the convergence of winds and then see if that could possibly explain the, the gap that we were seeing between known physics and what we, you know, what we observed. So basically I think the process of hypothesis exploration becomes, uh, you know, much easier after you've, uh, you know, you, you have access to the relevant parts of data that, that uh, is relevant to the problem. Okay. okay. And Shishir goes, goes on to ask, uh, GANs are generally very challenging to train. Yep. Uh, what is your experience on that for these projects? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, like, like I was talking about hyperparameter optimization, same thing applies for GANs. Uh, they are difficult to train. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think very few people really have that expertise on how do you uh, fine tune the learning rates and also fiddle with the architectures to, to make that work. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's no simple answer. I think you just have to develop that expertise over time. Um, I, I think it was also our hope at some point that maybe if we could suitably constrain the GAN to subscribe to them to some physical constraint that it, it would become easier to train. I, I don't think I've seen that either. So yeah, unfortunately it remains hard. Okay. Uh, there's a comment from Sandeep Trivedi who will ask you a question. Just so I can look at some literature who is doing the subgrid scale analysis using deep learning for climate studies that was mentioned in the talk. At Caltech, yep. for example, is it Tapio Schneider? That's yeah, so Papio is, is developing a new model, uh, a new data-driven model. And uh, he's hoping that some pieces of that model would use machine learning. It's actually unclear if he's going to use deep learning or not. There are some people in his group who are looking at this subgrid scale parameterization. So I would say that, you know, if you could refer back to the slide that I put up with those four or five papers, there are some PNAS papers there and, and okay, some James right. papers there. So that should give you um, a sense for what's happening. But frankly, I think at this point, if you just look for uh, subgrid scale processes, subgrid scale parameterization, deep learning, AI, okay. you will finally, you likely find dedicated sessions in uh, meetings like APS or AGU. Okay. And that will give you more pointers. Then, then Sanjay Chandrasekhar, um, he says most of the deep learning architectures, except maybe GAN, have come from cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. Is that still the case? Or are these ap application cases generating their own novel architectures? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, I think the relationship between uh, COGSI, you know, neuroscience, and um, I, I guess romantic notions of, you know, deep learning. <laughs> I, uh, anyway, I mean, I think there are good reasons for that, and that's 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 fine. Um, I yeah, I, I guess I would say that right now um, the folks who are actually pushing on the frontier of of uh, applied deep learning, I don't think that they are necessarily inspired by uh, brain how the brain works. I mean, I think they are doing all of the engineering tricks that they need to do to get to solve for this high dimensional optimization problem. So things like, you know, residual ResNets and um, uh, transformer-like models. Uh, th there are certainly many things that, that are counterintuitive uh, and are maybe not necessarily how the brain works. So I think, uh, you know, I would say that, again, I'm sure that Jan Lagoon, Jeff Hinton, they have much more principled answers on this, on why deep learning should mirror what, you know, how brain stores and, and organizes computation. 
but I think right now uh, engineers are doing whatever it takes to uh, to get these architectures to work better, which may or may not be brain inspired. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay. Yeah, and now I'll let Dhanraj and Arnab Sarkar. The name changed, but it's okay. Dhanraj and Arnab to ask their questions. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Dhanraj. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the field of this transport phenomena, uh, which involves this heat mass and uh, fluid transfer from one location to another. So, if I try to classify different kinds of experiments in the field of transport phenomena, and out of that, if I choose one such experiment, I mean, uh, with having which will be having some like a huge number of trials, will AI or let's say for that matter, machine learning help me to uh, predict that what kind of parameter is missing? Because it might happen that during design of experiments, uh, I, might miss, I may miss out on some parameter or let's say two to three parameters for that fact. So does AI or machine learning have this facility to just uh, give a kind of indication that no, this type of parameter is being missed uh, during the measurements? When you say parameter, what do you mean? What do you mean by a parameter? Uh, let's say for example, any physical parameter, any physical quantity for that matter. For example, let's say uh, viscosity or maybe say diffusion coefficient, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, since my problem is concerning the transport phenomena only, that's why. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that your simulation tool does not does not account for that parameter. So there's probably some missing physics there, and you would like deep learning to predict that a parameter is missing. Yeah, I mean, just a kind of indication or something. You know, if I early if, if earlier if I try to classify different kinds of experiments in the field of transport yeah. phenomena, based on that. Does AI help me to uh, give an indication that, okay, some pressure kind of parameter is missing, or let's say viscosity or something might be missing while you are performing the experiment. Some kind of, you know, uh, so that I can uh, perform my experiments with more refinement the next time. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds like an ill pose problem to me. I'm not okay. sure if AI can necessarily help with that. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I think that kinds of use cases where AI has been applied to similar things. Um, you know, maybe there's a, you know, a Rayleigh number that you've already accounted for in your simulation, you trained your network. Yes. And now you're trying to predict the output for a new Rayleigh uh, number that has not yet been simulated or vice versa. You're trying to, uh, you know, perhaps with an airfoil, you're trying to work out the optimal sort of um, attack angle or something to, 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 to get the least drag. Uh, so there are problems of those types that I've seen, but I think the specific thing that you have in mind in terms of missing physics or missing parameterization, yeah, I, I, I don't think you're going to get a crisp answer in that. You know, this this is the constant that is missing. I think that that sounds unlikely to me. Okay, just, just to give an analogy, uh, should I give you one more, one more example for that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like uh, when the spin was discovered, the uh, the spin of the particle. So mm -hmm. like based on the experiments, scientists try to uh, figure out that what is that actual variable or what is that actual parameter, which is, you know, giving such kinds of outputs. Mm -hmm. So they try to understand and finally they coined the term as spin and they attributed that spin is something which is, you know, causing the particle to behave in a certain way. So mm -hmm. is CF, I mean, uh, if I input uh, this kinds of data to this AI or ML to train my model, will this model help me to give this kind of prediction that, okay, this might be certain parameter or not? So, the nature no, of the parameter, basically. I yeah. think you, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it sounds a little unlikely to me. Um, I, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we, yeah, I think we have to be a little careful about uh, how much we really ask of the AI system. So, so I think, um, um, I mean, this, this is a great, you know, it's, it's certainly a problem at the limit because we don't because we don't quite know, uh, you know, what the limit is of expressiveness and power of these systems. Uh, we don't know what it can cannot do, but I, I think uh, you know, in terms of mechanistic insights into uh -huh. scientific phenomena, um, I, I, I think that is uh, you know unclear. Truly, you know, if, if there is a new parameter missing physics, missing parameterization. Uh, whether you know an AI system could vanilla you know give that to you? I, I, yeah, that that sounds a little uh, unlikely, but uh, but something that you know is worth exploring, I guess. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dhanraj. Um, Arnab, Arnab Sarkar. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, great lecture. 
Uh, I'm very new to this uh, artificial intelligence field, so my question might be a little uh, idiotic, I think, in many cases. So I'm just starting this uh, neural network study, and I am being an analytical scientist. I'm trying to looking for high accuracy and precision. So I'm, when I'm using this analytical, uh, this artificial neural network type program for uh, a big value of data to get a very accurate result, even with a long, very big uh, training set, I'm, I'm finding the results relatively poorer in form of accuracy and precision when I'm using my, in respect to the traditional, uh, like partial least square method, those are the matrix based methods. So uh, do you your comment on this part that the, for when I'm looking for a very high accuracy and precision, what will be the role of ANN? Yeah, you know, it's a little hard to answer in, in general why that's, that's happening. Um, like, I, I guess how, how uh, which ANN architecture did you start with? Have you tried experimenting with like a low complexity yeah, ANN? A two layer to three layers type of simple things I'm mm -hmm. trying. And this uh, is like a, is it a time series from or? Like no, no, no. It's, it's simple like, uh, it's like emission spectroscopy. So I have almost a 200 to 900 uh, nanometer emission spectra of multiple mm -hmm. elements. So there are all host of elements uh, emission spectra are there. Mm -hmm. so from there, usually we can particularly point out one spectra and make a calibration, get the data, which are which we are founding very accurate. But when I'm trying to give a, a bunch of training set about 200, 300 spectra and their uh, results, then the prediction accuracy, I'm finding a little bit of uh, inferior to the traditional uh, PLSC method or calibration based method. So, so your, training data just has, your training data set just has 200 spectra or 300 spectra? Um, uh, yes, about one spectra, every spectra have about 16,000 pixels and about two to 300 uh, spectra of yeah i'm not sure if that's enough for the that's enough training data for the problem um, um hmm. and like what is the task uh it's what is it that qu quantify some concentration mm -hmm. so, uh, let me i'm i'm dealing with some nuclear materials so the accuracy of certain impurities is very important so i have to accurately measure some ppm level so, mm -hmm. so that's why I looking at whether NN can give me that amount of accuracy of five to five to ten percent accuracy. But the accuracy I'm getting is about something about thirty percent. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm just guessing that uh, should this NN more type of difficult NN should be introduced to we can improve the result or uh, NN may be a better for uh, a broad type of understanding, but for particular accuracy and precision, whether it will be good anywhere. Yeah. Yes. So I, I, I think again, it, to me, I think it feels like you have a high dimension problem, right? So the 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 size, of, the dimensionality of your spectra is quite large, but then you just have 200, 300 samples. I yeah, I'm not sure if that's enough enough training data to uh, to fit. So you may certainly choose to like increase the complexity or the 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 number of layers and so on in your in your neural network, uh, but I'm not sure if the, there is enough training data for this problem. So basically, I think what I would rather do. So again, you know, please. I think one one important takeaway is that don't you know, please don't take away from this talk that I should drop what I'm doing and I start using deep learning for my problem. So I think if there are historically there are methods that have worked that you uh, have maybe fine tuned for the kinds of you know wherever you're on the precision recall curve and you're happy with those, so be it. Um, but uh, you know, if you choose to experiment with deep learning, then again, based on how much data you might have available to you, you may or may not be able mm -hmm. to get to, uh, necessarily a state-of-the-art result out of the box. So you will need to be principled in how you explore the trade-off space for uh, for deep learning. Okay. Arnab, is that okay? Perfectly, thank you. Okay, thank you, Arnab. Uh, I, I'm, I, I apologize to all the members that we can't take all the questions right now, but as, you, as the slide presents itself, uh, he can be reached at prabhat at berkeley.edu. And I think um, Dhanpal and Sharvesh, I request you to email him. Prabhat, if you were kind enough to respond to the emails, that would be great. I think this, these questions could be addressed through email as well. 
Um, but I would like to conclude the session because it's been a, 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 an hour and 40 minutes and we have, I'm sure, um, Prabhat, uh, although energized, but I'm sure uh, it, it's a long session for him too. Um, I, would, uh, I, I would like to thank you, Prabhat, for taking the time out, uh, waking up early in the morning and giving us this wonderful talk and introducing us to deep learning and um, be, being very patient to address questions as diverse as we've heard today. And um, uh, we are very certainly appreciative, not only the TIFR audience, but I just wanted to say that because what Shravan uh, had done was he advertised the talk, there were um, actually 130 participants today for this uh, colloquium. I'm very thankful to Shravan and everyone for joining in and uh, putting this through and, and giving such a warm audience to Prabhat. Um, uh, we will continue next week with our colloquium series uh, where we have uh, Professor Tejinder Singh, uh, TP as we call him, who is going to talk about why do elementary particles have such strange looking mass ratios. So until then, um, it's a goodbye to all of you and thank you once again. So Prabhat, I just would like to sort of mention that um, uh, this is a sort of uh, uh, a pretty amazing experience for all of us, uh, uh, starting up with deep learning. And, and we would like to continue with sort of maybe um, calling back you again uh, in a forum like this, where we might actually have a discussion room where we can sort of talk about applications in more general general format. So yeah, uh, I think as I offered that to Shravan that you know if um, yes, Shravan already has a plan for a workshop. Yeah, the, the students sure. or for the faculty, you know, if um, if there's any further discussion you'd like to have, yeah, happy to, you know, sure. respond. Thank to you. Thank you. Shabbat, thank you a lot, Prabhat. Words? Yeah, yeah, I just, I, I love the talk. It was really good. It was, uh, it was really exciting. So thank you so much, Prabhat. Really uh, okay. appreciate your time. You must be exhausted. <laughs> We've been no, grilled. No. grilled.